Hi guys, Chris Story here. Today I'm going to talk about, in an AFL context, why I've been talking about the ultimate transfer of wealth and how that applies to this delisted free agency period. But first I'm going to start off by showing you some of the articles that I've written recently for ESPN. Before getting a start on today's topic, I thought I'd alert you to, on ESPN, my two round phantom draft is up. And of course, as we get closer to the draft, I'll be publishing my full phantom draft. So that's something to look out for. And also on Monday, the piece relating to who I believe should be the real pick one and who Adelaide should be picking first up was also published. So that's another worthwhile read, particularly for those that have been engaging of late in the debate as to, well, should it be McDonald or should it be Riley Tilthorpe with pick one to Adelaide? So for those who haven't been following, so we've had a reduction of the primary list. So previously it was 38 to 40, now it's down to 36 to 38. So reduction of essentially two. And the overall list size, including rookies, and that's category A rookies, category B rookies. So it was a maximum of 47, now it's down to 44. And now all lists have a minimum size of 37 players, they must have. So why am I even talking about delisted players? Aren't they meant to be terrible? Well, teams just cut them. Well, the news this year is that, well, there's more opportunity than there has been in any other year, given the reduction of list sizes. I've got more players delisted who are very capable, and these guys are my picks. And the bolded ones I want to, I guess, draw special attention to. So... Jackson Hayatley is my number one ranked player, so he's someone where lock and load, best 22 for Adelaide. If you're a super coach or AFL fantasy player, lock him in. He's a round one starter, direct replacement for Brad Crouch. So um, The problem for him, so for GWS, it's just been not enough midfield opportunity. They haven't given him those chances. I'm not even sure if he's started at a stoppage yet for GWS. He was forced to play really outside, even halfback flank sometimes, and... Look, he could do those sorts of roles, but he's an inside midfielder. And I think he's really going to find his niche there with that opportunity for Adelaide. So I think he'll be a terrific long-term player. And he could be a 200 gamer. So he wasn't actually, in my opinion, a bad selection for GWS at the time. It was just a case of, well, they just didn't need his time, ultimately, having such a surplus of midfielders. So my number two player, so I've got Connor Ballenden from Brisbane. So he was delisted with the plan to reselect as a rookie to make more room on the senior list due really to the list reduction. So my opinion is that he's a key defender with great scope to play and he's someone where unfortunately he hasn't had the opportunity with Brisbane but with senior AFL opportunities I think he'll be a really good player and I think he can be a clear decisive best 22 player. So for any team looking for that key defender I would be really making those calls to Connor and saying, hey, we want you. Because he can play and he's someone where once he gets those games, a bit like Noah Bolter this year, perhaps not to that same extent, but he's just one of those guys where he can play. He's got those needful performances behind him. Not that that's necessarily a high standard of league, but he's someone where, look, he can win one-on-ones, high level in a set mark and take contested grabs, can go forward and actually look good and same in the ruck. But for me, his spot's a key defender. And if I was developing him, well, I feel that's where his talents would be absolutely maximised. So anyone looking for a key defender, get on him. Next up, so Matthew Kennedy. So my view with him for Carlton is that he actually had a breakout year this year. And what's he do best? Well, was a ball winning inside mid. So he's had a little bit of minor success as a forward. And look, you can rest him forward. That's fine. He can provide a marking target, kick a few goals here and there. Forward pressure not great, but as a ball winning mid, look, he can really win it. Be a sort of, he can probably be a third or fourth best mid. And for me, he's someone where, look, if you're needing a big bodied ball winning mid, he's someone where absolutely go after him and take advantage of Carlton delisting him with the chance to rookie him. I'd get in first. He's someone where I'd absolutely be wanting him. So next up, so Marty Gleeson, and he's someone where, again, same story as the likes of Ballenden and Kennedy, where Essendon do plan to relist him and get him as a rookie just to make that additional space. And for me, this is a real opportunity here where Gleeson, although he's a really light-framed type, is actually a really high-level one-on-one player, which a lot of people don't recognise. And in addition to that, well, he's a great intercept mark, 
He's got all the rebounding capabilities. He's actually a very good ball user. So um, he's someone where, in my opinion, he's an any team best 22 player. So um, if I want any defenders at all, I would be getting Gleason, and I would be very, very happy with that, to say the least. So, And whether that's whether I want a shutdown guy, an interceptor, a rebounder, I'd feel pretty confident just plug him in any role in defense. He's just a really good general defender. So... Um, he's someone I'd be extraordinarily comfortable in taking, and he's someone, frankly, I'm very surprised that Essendon would delist with the intent to re-rookie, because with the losses of, you've lost Saad, you've lost McKenna, they really need those good defenders, and if Gleeson gets picked up before Essendon get the chance to re-list him as a rookie, well, my opinion is their defence is looking pretty light on, so... Um, yeah, he's definitely someone I'd be targeting. Really. So for the last of my bolded players and the ones that I'd really make a point of saying really pretty much most teams should be going after, so Noah Gown. So he can play key forward, key back. Um, if a club really wants a young key forward, well, he's one that I'd really be looking at. And I'd sort of look at him pretty favourably to a lot of the key forwards in the draft that are sort of viewed as sort of later picks, where, yeah, you can get a Jackson Callow and get some value laid or maybe a Kane Baldwin, but other than those two, well, Noah Gown would be the guy that, if I didn't have an early pick to get one of the really absolute top-end key forwards, well, Noah Gown would probably be the guy where I'd be trying to find a way to add him to my list. So, um, so yeah, and with his game as well. So, what he did in his first year in the VFL was actually play a really good brand. So, he was hitting the, the scoreboard, he was setting up score assists, score involvements, he was taking marks inside 50, he could win the ground balls, so he was doing a lot well, and even his pressure was pretty strong, where he was really giving a good level of effort, where he was tackling good forward pressure, so I guess having that whole pretty well-rounded mix to his game, it's really quite surprising to me that Essendon have given up on Gown so quickly, and here's someone where I would absolutely be willing, after just two years, to give him a second chance. And look, in fairness to Essendon, I haven't really seen, I haven't seen any of what he's done this year because he hasn't played a senior game, and of course, there's no VFL. But based off what I saw of him in his first year, I'd absolutely be saying, yeah, he needs to get a second chance because he's someone where, having seen him as a junior, seen his first year in the VFL, he's a really good key forward, and there's even scope to put him as a key back if you wanted to develop, to develop him in that way because he's got that one-on-one -on -one strength, good reader of the ball in flight, so he's got that scope even as an intercept mark behind the play, so he's someone where absolutely I'd be very keen to add to my list. And look, as a key forward, a Ballenden's more optimal, but as a second option, and I know I prefer Ballenden as a key back, but Noah Gown's probably that sort of second key position player that I'm particularly high on of those really young guys. So, next up, so if I really want that lockdown key defender, so Majak Dor would be my guy. So, whether it's a Western Bulldogs, maybe it's a West Coast, I really like what he offers and the flexibility and options he gives you. So, um, and if he can be even a little bit like what he was pre-injury, well then, that's really what you're after. And watching him this year, well he was playing key forward, so and maybe a little bit of ruck, so he's played out of position. Where he's played easily his best football as a key defender, and having not really seen him as that key defender this year, well, I'd have to give him the benefit of the doubt and really just expect that, yeah, look, he can, I guess, return to at least a reasonable level as a key defender. So at least he gives you an option, and at worst, his depth. So that's what you'd be considering there. But if all works out, well, he's a good piece. So... A Lewis Jetta, so he's someone where I felt like this year he was a bit underused by West Coast, and he's still got the speed, he still provides the run. Yeah, he doesn't win the contested ball, but at least he's going to really get the ball moving and moving aggressively. So any team needing that outside speed, outside drive, he's someone where I'd be pretty willing to invest in him if I'm a bit deficient and really need that sort of spark short term. And Shane Savage is a similar story, where he's still actually quite a good piece, and Again, if you really want that drive, that really long kick that can do some damage, well, Savage is a piece for me where you can absolutely plug and play him for a team. And a, a bit like with a Jetta and even a Door, well, there's a few teams where I could 
say he'd be a best 22 player. But just with St Kilda, of course, having... They've almost got two teams worth of depth in defence. So just having that many defenders, there just wasn't the opportunity this year for him. But he's someone on a team where if they're short a good defender or two, or at least a good rebounder, well, as that rebounder, then Savage is someone where, again, I'd be pretty happy to invest in him. But these ones where they're the non-bolded guys, well, they're really just the situational types where, yeah, maybe they can provide some value for a team or a selection of teams even if it's just a few and Matthew Scharenberg's another again that I fit into that category where for an Adelaide where well what's Scharenberg known for well he's he was known from a really young age for his leadership capabilities and he's someone where although he's been injured well he's still young enough and he's a capable enough ball user good interceptor finds more than enough of it and although his one-on-one capabilities haven't yet translated to AFL level I feel that given his success one-on-one as a junior he should also be stronger in that category. So I think he's someone where, as long as he's healthy, I think he's pretty well a plug and play and just gives another option. So I think he could offer in another situation some potential value. So he's someone I haven't fully given up on, even if a Collingwood in delisting him obviously have. So So next up at John Marsh. So he's someone where I feel like St Kilda have just thrown him everywhere and that's really unsettled him. So... He's someone where he played key defender for Collingwood, looked really good there, and then after that decided he wanted to retire, head back home to WA, and that was obviously his choice. But then he wanted another shot, St Kilda picked him up in the mid-season draft, I believe it was, or maybe the pre-season supplementary period. So, um, yeah, he's someone where I feel like, particularly as a key defender, he adds value. As a forward, I'd probably feel he's a bit shaky, but and maybe he could even be a tall ball winning mid as he was showing a bit in the waffle but I really like him running off out of defense where he's a good contested mark he and then he has that sort of rebounding component with the run where he's an absolute elite sort of speed guy where he's in that I guess you're a Sam Frost category for speed where just the sheer acceleration out of there is big time so um yeah he's someone where I'd feel pretty comfortable and I don't feel like he's quite got that fair shake for St Kilda. So I think there's still a little bit of untapped opportunity there. And if you're looking for something like a decent centre-half back that's mid-career, you can get, say, five years or so out of him at a decent enough level and you're really lacking that player at that position, or even if it's just that lacking of depth, well, Marsh definitely gives you that option. So, But I think he can be a little better than depth. I'm not proposing any of these guys as depth options, I would say if you're getting them, we'll get them because you think they can legitimately be best 22 players because just getting depth, well, you're better off just going through the draft and trying to find someone who can provide pretty immediate value but long-term can be that best 22 piece. So next up, so we've got Mason Wood. So he's played forward over the years but he's someone where I think really to build a level of consistency into his game and make him an able AFL footballer and someone who can play a few more years well I think he really needs to transition into defence so what's he do well well he's a great mark and he's an aerial specialist so if you look at the success of someone like a Jeremy Howe in defence he started as a forward he was pretty decent as a forward lacked consistency well but then he moved in as a key defender and obviously has gone on and achieved great success and although I'm not suggesting Mason Wood will become Jeremy Howe I do think for those same reasons just looking at his attributes that if I was a club looking for that intercept marking sort of tallish defender well I would be definitely investing in Mason Wood who is is still working at his game he's sort of having an early pre-season because he obviously wants another shot at another I guess AFL opportunity so if I was to sort of look for that sort of player, Mason Wood is someone that I would definitely be open to considering, but not as a forward. I don't think he's got that level of consistency where I'd feel comfortable with him as a forward. But down back, yep, a yes for me. So Pittard, so he's someone where, again, very selective situations where he could add value, but if I'm a team like, say, in Essendon, where you've lost all your rebound in the likes of a McKenna, you've lost a Saad, well... You, you really need that sort of guy where he can add that veteran leadership where he's a really good clubman, but he can also provide that rebound. And absolutely, is blunder-prone. He'll turn over the footy from time to time, but he can generate meaningful drive. And 
if you don't have that guy who can generate meaningful drive, well, then I, I guess you're missing out on an opportunity because you really do want that rebounder from defence, or at least one or two options that can. So, last but not least, so Grant Birchall. So he's someone where, he, although he's probably, he might just be in his final year, maybe he's got one more year left in, maybe two if you're lucky and his body holds up. Well, he's someone where just as a general defender, rebounding defender, he's still pretty good. He can still intercept, can still use the ball, still decent enough one-on-ones. So, yeah, if you're after that short one-year rental, then, yeah, absolutely he's someone that I'd be looking at and just as that sort of short-term option. So the question I'll answer now, well, what is the transfer of wealth? Well, what it is, is it's the transferring from basically the unintelligent to the intelligent. So, and it's a personal finance concept where those who make sound decisions, they understand what they should be investing in when, they're the ones that get ahead. Those that don't understand those concepts, well, they're the ones that fall behind. And that's been the story of this off season where you've had the likes of Geelong really understand the salary cap and really get ahead. Where within the salary cap, well, they've had room to add Jeremy Cameron, who if he was playing in the grand final, well, that might've been a difference maker had he been there because it had released danger to the midfield and we might've had a bit of a more exciting game, I suspect. And then the likes of an Isaac Smith, well, Geelong on the outside, they've lacked speed. So adding that again, huge difference maker. And then a Sean Higgins, well, again, more quality through the midfield and another difference maker. So being able to make those sort of changes, well, that's huge when you've got a contender really being able to add quality. And then you look on the other end of the spectrum, well, what's happened with Collingwood? Well, unfortunately, they've let go capable players and they've received really nothing meaningful in return. So that's really what the whole concept is about. And the trade period, free agency period, my personal view is, well, we've had a historic opportunity. And a lot of clubs have missed the opportunity, but some, fortunately for them, have made the most of it. And Geelong was one such example among quite a few that did quite well. And then I'm looking at this delisting period as, I guess, another opportunity here and now as well, where if you're really identifying opposition talent at a strong level, which is one of the best ways to improve a list in a hurry, and one of those, I guess, budget opportunities a lot of the time, if you can really identify the talent, well, you've got a real chance to go ahead. And some of these players, not all are suitable for all clubs, but there's a few where if your need is for someone of that type, well, I would be investing. And those first five that I had bolded, well, if I'd really be hoping to have the list positions available to be able to add them all because they're players where I think they can definitely add value and they're players where I would wager on every list there'd be players that just aren't, as good in terms of long-term value, just wouldn't be players I'd necessarily want as much. So these are guys where I'd be really dead keen on them. And those who are already established players, well, they're average to above average players. And I'd personally say they're more your above average. Whereas you've got the likes of a Ballenden or a Gown where I think they're genuine best 22 chances. So they're guys that I'd be investing in. And I'm one of the pickiest guys with key forwards. For those that have seen my video relating to how I stack up in terms of selections of key position players compared to clubs, well, you'll be able to see for the vast majority of the cases, not always, there's some guys I rate quite a lot higher, but for the most part, I tend to be a bit of a harder judge on key position players. And I'm very anti-depth where I really want the very top quality guys, but I also want them at the right valuation and I don't believe in overpaying. So um, I believe there are opportunities and on the trade market, there were a lot, several that were acquired and several that could have been acquired potentially and have been maybe missed opportunities. But again, during this delisted free agency period, well, there's some opportunities to add some really meaningful key position players, but then also players in other positions as well. So thanks for watching and let me know in the comment section below. Are there any delisted free agents that you'd like your club to pick up? Was it someone from my list or is it someone else that I might not necessarily race and didn't include on my list? And also make sure you look out for my upcoming power rankings. This will be my final power rankings of the year. So um, it'll be my December edition. So it'll come out at the very start of the month. So probably the first or the second. So keep your eyes peeled and watch on ESPN for more about that. And I may do a later video 
covering off on those players and maybe give a bit more depth. So let me know if you'd like something on that. Maybe I go through my extended power rankings and give a bit of detail on really who's in my top 50, if that's something people would like to see, because on ESPN, they only really want to see my top 20. But I think there's probably enough interest out there for a top 50. So let me know in the comment section below, top 50, if you want to see that. Thanks guys. See you in the next video.